Well, we are in the third week of our series titled, We Are That Church. Say it with me. We are that church. And what we've been talking about is lessons from the book of Acts, uh, because we like to say that we're a 21st century expression of a first century experience. And if you don't get that, go back on YouTube. You can figure it all out. But basically what we're trying to say is we want to look like the church looked in the book of Acts. But how many of you know that we have cars now and we have air conditioning and we have phones and so so we can have the same principles we can have the same values but things may look a little bit different and, and so we're in week three and today what i want to talk to you is i want to talk to you about this idea of belonging somebody say belonging because i know that the world is searching for belonging that, 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 you, that many of you in here today, I've already talked to people after the first service. They say, I, I came today looking for a place where I could find people that I can know, people that will love me, people that will be with me in the hard times. I, I'm looking for a place of belonging. And so many people in the world today are lonely. They feel like it's the, them against the world, that they have no one in their corner. And, and what I want to talk to you about today is the church is supposed to be that place. That, that the church is supposed to be a community of people that no matter what you look like, no matter what your race is, your ethnicity, no matter how much money you make, no matter what your education status, no matter what, that you can belong here, that there is a place for you here. And I don't know if there's a place for you in every church, but because we are that church, there's a place for you here. That, that we are, are fighting to be a church where everyone belongs. That, that we are fighting for unity. There, there's not much that we'll fight about. Uh, I, I won't fight you about your eschatology and what you believe about the rapture. And all, I, but, but a few things that we will fight about, and one of those is community and unity. That, that we will be a place where people can be long and where they can love no matter what they look like, no matter what they talk like, even no matter what they believe. I want to let you know that if you're in here today and you're just kind of testing the waters and you don't know about all this, that we still love you, that you still belong here, that you're welcomed here, that we're so thankful that you're with us today. So we're going to talk about that a little bit today. Turn with me to Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 42. And uh, in my Bible, this says the community, uh, I'm sorry, the believers form a community. The believers form a community. Anybody got your Bible with you this morning? Come on, a few of you got your Bible. I know we got it on the screens. I read a lot off my phone, but there's just something about having your Bible. Like, like I got blood, sweat, and tears in this thing. I've got my highlights. I've got my notes. And I would just encourage you, if you don't have a Bible, we can get you one. You need a Bible that can be your Bible because there's some stuff in here that you need to know. There's encouragement for your life. There's some life lessons. And uh, so just get a Bible. I'm going to just throw that out. Out there. But Acts chapter 2, verse 42 says, All the believers devoted themselves. Now, I just want to pause right there because I could preach a whole sermon to all of us believers. I know we have people in here that are checking things out, but where are my believers at? Do I have any believers in here? Any Christians? Okay, I, I could preach a whole sermon to us just about being devoted. The, the believers were devoted. That it wasn't a question. It wasn't, how do I feel this morning? Am I going to go to church today? Am I going to pray today? Am I going to read my Bible today? Or am I, am I going to have faith today? No, no, no. I am devoted. I've already made up my mind. I've already decided that Jesus is alive, that he's real, that I'm giving my life towards him. I'm giving my career towards him. I'm devoted. So I could preach a sermon about that, but I'm not. I'll just give you that. The believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and to fellowship. And to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, which is what we just did, communion, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over all of them, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together in the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all people. And listen to this, and each day the Lord added to their fellowship those that were being saved, those that were being saved. That's, that's what I want our church to be, is I, I want to be a community like this. I want to speak to you just for a few moments on this idea, a home for humanity, a home for humanity. You can underline that. We are a community. We are a community. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, we thank you for what you're going to do today. We thank you for what we've already felt and worship, God. We, we thank you for what you're going to speak to us today. Help it not to be my words, but your words. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, come on, come on. 
Well, hey, uh, I have a question for you. How many of you um, love being at home? We got anybody that loves being at home? L- love being at your home. Come on, there's just something that being, about being at your home. Uh, it smells the way that you're used to. You got your spot. Like how many of you have your chair in the living room? Or you got your spot on the couch, and when it's family movie night, it's like, you better get out of my spot, because that's got my indention in it. I've been working on that for 10 years. It molds perfectly to my body. It's not a Tempur-Pedic, but it's just kind of working out that way now, and it's got my sweat stains on it and my Cheeto fingerprints, and that's just my spot on the couch right there, because this is my house. Like, how many of you, you're uncomfortable when you go to somebody else's house? Because what is normal for them, you're like, this is just weird. Like, I do not understand this. My problem is when I go to somebody's house and I can never find the cups. I don't know, it's just maybe me. Uh, last service, nobody understood this, but every family puts cups in different places. Like some of you put the cups next to the sink because if you're like me, you drink water from the sink because we ain't got no time for bottled water. Uh, it, it's clean enough for you, okay? Uh, you can put it next to the sink to get some water or some people put it next to the refrigerator because, you know, it might be, might be a little bit more bougie with, you know, their, their purified water. Uh, and so some of you didn't get that. It's okay. Uh, uh, but, but maybe they put it in this. Some people, I think they put it like in their back shipping container, like in their backyard or something because I've looked in every cabinet and cannot find a cup for a drink. They're like, make yourself at home. Just grab a cup out of the cabinet. Where are they though? Like, I do not know where the cups are because this is not my house and this, this feels weird. Uh, but we all have things that just make stuff feel like home for us. For me, I think what makes me feel the most at home is uh, two ingredients that it just takes to make my home, me and Hannah's home, our home is coffee and candles. Like, like, if we do not have coffee and candles, something is wrong with us. Like, pre- please pray for us. Like, ask what's going on because we got to have different, we got to have Nespresso, then we got to have the coffee pot, then we got to have iced coffee in the refrigerator, and then maybe just go to Starbucks just for another option, uh, just because we're coffee. And then candles. How many of you like candles? Where are my candle people out here? You know you got to have your fall scents. We're going into the spring scents right now. Some linen smells, you know, some flowery smells. And I just walk in and you just smell, you're just... That's my house. That smells like coffee grounds and and pumpkin pie. That's my house right now. This is my house. There's just things that make us feel at home. And some of you are like, what is he going to get to the Bible? Like, what's going on right now? But but there's things that make us feel at home. And and I think what happens is, is so many of us, we oftentimes are looking for those things that make us feel at home. And I think so many people, statistically, even people in this room, many of you probably feel like you never quite feel at home. You, you never feel like you fit in. And maybe you have a home, and, but, but feel at home with people. You, you haven't found your group. You haven't found your community. You haven't found people where you're like, these are my people. I relate to them. We like the same things. We listen to the same kind of music. We relate to each other. And I think what it is, is, is there are ingredients for this finding a home or or finding community. But what has happened is in in the Western world, and especially in America, we begin to take out essential ingredients, but we're still expecting the same result. And and so we have taken out things that must happen for us to feel like we belong, for us to feel like we are loved, for us to feel like there are people that care about us. And we've taken them out. And how many of you know, uh, if you're like me, you've ever tried a recipe and you start taking out ingredients, you do not end up with what you want. Anybody been there before? Uh, when, when I was single, I used to get on uh, Pinterest, you know, <laughs> Pinterest, and uh, I, I would look up these recipes, and some of these recipes, I swear, you have to go to uh, Nantucket and go on a mountain <laughs> and, and go to Nepal and ask a, a monk to get a special herb. I'm like, what is this? I've never even heard of this before. I've never even heard of this spice, and I'm sure not going to go to H-E-B because I'm hungry right now. So I'm going to just maybe skip over that one, and, and I'm going to skip over, and hopefully it'll turn out the same. Like, like it's just a little teaspoon here, a little tablespoon there, but, but the end result is not quite what you're looking for. And so many of us, we are trying to find a place of belonging. We're trying to find a place that we can call home, but we're missing ingredients. And what we are doing is we'll just go from place to place and friends group to friends group and city to city and church to church and small group to small group. And we'll look for, I I just don't belong here. I just can't find. But can I tell you that you are not looking for a place. You are looking for a people because home is not a place. Community is not a place. It is a people 
to belong to a people that are diverse, that are multi-ethnic, that are different ages. You need to belong to a community that can really help you grow. And so what I was, as I was looking through this passage of Scripture, we're kind of getting a little teachy in this Acts uh, act series because I think there are th- some things that we have to get right about community for it to work out the way that we think it should work out. Right. Because so many people, we come in and we're like, well, I just can't experience that. I've just never experienced that kind of love before. I just don't really know what he's talking about. I- I've never really felt that love that people f- say they feel in church, all that sort of thing. And I think it's because we have the ingredients wrong. I think it's because we are missing some things, and I just want to let you know that, that we're going to be that church where we work on this idea of community, where, where we work on this idea of unity, where we work together, and it may be hard, and then we may struggle a little bit, and we may get a little offended, and we may get a little bit hurt, but we're saying, hey, we are committed to this idea of where we are doing this together. Like this mission that we have been put on, it's not even so much about what we're doing, it's about who we're doing it with. It's about us all moving forward as a family, as a body of Christ, moving forward to what God has called us to do. Are you with me this morning? I'm already sweating, so you just better get ready. So, so there are these ingredients that make up this home that I think we're all searching for, that, that make up this community of believers, this community of people. And, and the first one is this, the, the gathering. Like if you're going to have a community of people, you're going to have to get together. Like you're going to have to have a party. You're going to have to have a, uh, you're going to have to chill. You're going to have to have a kickback. Like you're going to have to get together with some people at some point if you're going to really know them. Like, like you're going to have to have a gathering where you're going to take some time out of your schedule and travel a little distance and do something that's maybe not super beneficial to you and say, well, me gathering together with those people is worth the sacrifice that it takes. That's why I think it shouldn't even be really a question if you're going to come to church on a Sunday. That's why we don't even really advertise, well, we're singing this song and this is who's preaching today and this is what you're going to get today because it shouldn't even be about what you're going to get here. It should be about just the idea that we're all coming together. It's like, hey, I don't really care what's happening at church today. My family is at church. My friends are at church and I got to be around the community. Like we got to gather together. It's not so much about what you're doing, it's about who you're doing it with. And so in the New Testament, they had two separate types of gatherings. They gathered in the temple, and they gathered in homes. And and I want to kind of relate gathering in the temple to what we're doing right now. And I know some of you, I'm not going to go super deep theological. We don't believe this is the temple. We believe that God's spirit is everywhere in the earth, that you don't have to come here to experience God. You can experience him wherever you are. But there is power in gathering together in large groups. Because why would the New Testament apostles and disciples have done it if there wasn't power in it? That they knew that there was a reason. And I think one of the reasons that we gather together is you need to see that there are other people like you in the world. Because so many of us, we get caught up in this thing. Well, I'm the only one going through this, and I'm the only one that believes this, and I'm the only Christian at my job, and nobody's going through this. Nobody has this struggle with the faith. Uh, and nobody has this doubt about God. Nobody's going through these things. And you get around people, and you're like, wait. There's some people that are like me. Like like I know Austin is very liberal and isn't very religious, but there are some people that are like me and we can gather together and there is power in a gathering. When we all start singing together, when we all start clapping, when we all start learning the same text from the Bible, there's power of us gathering together in a large group. And so they gathered together in a large group, but they also gathered in smaller groups. They, they, they gathered in homes. And, and the thing that I, the reason I think you need to gather together in homes is because in this environment, even though there's not thousands and thousands of people to here today, in this environment, you can still hide. Like, like you can hide what's really going on with you. Like, like you can come in this environment on a Sunday morning and, you know, there's people leaving a service and you're coming into a service and people are like, how are you doing today? And you're like, I'm blessed and highly favored. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. If you say one more thing, I'm going to punch you in the face, but praise the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> and you can hide what you're really going through and you and your wife were just cussing at each other, but you're like, our marriage is going great. You know, we can teach you some things if you need to know some stuff and <laughs> hallelujah. And, you know, the, the, but you, you can hide what's really going on. And you can hide what you're going through. And, and the thing that worries me is I don't think it's your fault. 
I think it's the fault of churches for generations now. We have put forth the idea of when you come to church, you better look right, you better smell right, you better talk right, you better have the right clothes on, you better have the right words to say, you better have your Bible, you better have all your stuff together, and don't bring any of that in here. Like, don't bring any of that mess in here. When it should be the opposite. It should be that this is the place that you bring all your mess. Like maybe when you go to work, you got to leave it at home. Or maybe when you go, but when you come to church, this should be the place where it's like, hey, I'm just really messed up right now. Like I just really need some help right now. And we've got to build a church. We've got to build a community to where when you do that, you're not judged. Because I guarantee you, all of us have been in a church environment before where we've told somebody something that we're really going through. And they've been like, I'm going to pray for you, a.k.a. I'm about to text all my friends about this. And the thing that is hurting us and the thing that we're trying to get help for actually is used against us again and hurts us even more. And so you, you can hide in this environment, but when you're in a small group where you really open yourselves up to each other, and I'm not even necessarily talking about a church-specific small group, but I'm talking about a few people that are in your life where you can really show them, hey, this is the messed up stuff inside of me. Because you got to have somebody that you can check in with or maybe even have where they check in with you and they're like, hey, I know you're struggling with that thing. How are you doing today? Like, how's it going today? Because if not, we'll just... We'll just bury things and hide things, but you got to have some people that can get together where you can talk through some stuff. This is what James chapter 5 says. It says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Because see, you can get forgiveness just by you and God. Like you can be forgiven. You're saved by grace alone. Like you're on your way to heaven. You are good, but you can still be hurting. Like you can still be broken. And I know even in my life, there are times where I'm like praying and I'm praying about it. And God, why won't you help me? And he's like, because I, I can't help you heal. Jesus. And don't get it twisted because I know you're like, well, God can heal. all. But, but sometimes you need some people that can get in your life. And they can see the broken part of you and the messed up side of you and the twisted side of you and the sinful side of you. And they can say, hey, I see that part of you and I'm not going to judge you. I'm not going to treat you any differently. I'm just going to be here with you until you get healed. I'm going to walk this journey with you. We got to be a church where we can be fully known and still be loved. Where somebody can know just how messed up we are and they don't treat us any differently. In fact, they may treat us better because when you start to really expose yourself, that's when you're going to get in real community. That's when you're going to really get to know people. That's when you're really going to get, oh, these are real people. These aren't just robotic churchy responses of, well, I'm good and amen, praise the Lord. And I, I believe in the power of confession. I believe in being faithful, but also we have to create an environment where we can just say, hey, I am not okay. Amen. Like, like I'm not doing good right now. And so we're trying to create that. We have our gatherings here. We're going to have more gatherings. We're, we're talking about other campuses, and we're expanding. We're building a new building so that we can hold more people in these gatherings. And then also in the fall, we're relaunching our care courses. We're, we're launching connect groups. We're doing these things. We're going to help you find those people. Because I think so many times we're looking for it, but we, ju we just we don't know where to look. We, we don't know who we can talk to. We don't know who we can trust. And so we want to help you do that because we're a community. So, so we have to gather. The second part is... And just stick me with me on this. Don't, don't tighten up. The second part is giving. The gathering, and they were giving. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. Here's the deal. Real community is going to cost you something. Real community is going to take sacrifice. It's going to take you having something that is precious to you and giving it away to someone else. And just a little side note on this, this is what I think is interesting when we talk about money in church and people get all tense and like, well, I don't know where that is in the New Testament. Well, in the New Testament, they just gave all. So, so if you want to sell all your house and just give it all, I'm good with that. I'm good with that. So if we just going to be real New Testament, I don't know if I believe in that. Okay, well, they just gave all their money to the apostles. So I'm just, just throwing that out there. But, but I think this is more important because everybody thinks about money. Well, even when we talk about giving, it's always about money. Money, you just want my money. The church wants my money. No, no, I think we need something that's more precious than our money, our time. Yeah. 
Because I think a lot of us are real quick to give somebody 20 bucks and say, okay, I checked that off my list. I'm a good person, rather than talking about with them and seeing what's really going on in their life. Like, like, I know you need this gas money, but more than you need this gas money, there's probably some things going on that you really just need to talk to somebody about. Like, you really probably just need somebody to encourage you right now. You need somebody just to speak into your life right now, to speak blessing, to speak life. So, so it's going to take some sacrifice. We're, we're going to have to sacrifice some things. And, and what the New Testament church was known for is they were focused more on giving than getting. I'm going to say that again. They were more focused on giving than getting. And, and I'm, not just talking about, I'm not just talking about money. I'm talking about everything. They were saying, who can I pray for today? Who can I encourage today? Who can I share the gospel with today? Who can I give money to today? Who can I share my wealth with today? Who can I invite into my home today? Who can I give to today? Because they were focused more on giving than they were on getting. But, but here's the interesting thing to me. If we would all focus on giving to each other, all of our needs would be met. So if we would take our eyes off of ourselves and our needs and what we're going through and say, I'm going to meet the needs of somebody else, someone will then see that and meet your needs. That's how the New Testament church worked. That we're all gathering together, meeting each other's needs. And I'm going to be honest for you, this is a hard thing for me to talk about because I do not like giving people my time. Like, let's just, can we just be real for a second? Oh, y'all going to be fake now. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> You don't like it either, but I'm a DC personality, which means I am task-oriented. If you know the DISC model, those of you that have taken in business, different things, we do it at next steps. It'll help you discover who you are because you can't know who God wants you to be until you realize who you are. Just throwing that out there. Uh, next steps, be there 2 o'clock next Sunday. That's my little plug. But, but, but I, I am focused much more on the task. And so when I was a little bit younger than I am now, and I know some of you are like, is he like 18? Like how much younger was he in this story? But, but when I was a little bit younger, I started working for this ministry and, and they hired me to do a task and I was going to get it done because I'm a go-getter. Like I set goals, I'm going to get it done. I'm a driver, I'm a pusher. Uh, my personality leans towards being a workaholic. Like it's, it's just who I am. And so I was just going, I was getting it done. I was doing great. It was the best thing they'd ever seen in my mind. Like I was just moving and grooving and doing all this stuff. And, and then, I, then they sat me down and said, hey, I, I know you're doing a good job and you're t checking all your stuff off your task list, but we just got to let you know, like we all think you're a jerk. <laughs> They may have used a little bit more colorful language than that, to be honest. <laughs> but they said, we know you're getting all this stuff done, but there are some people around you, and even though you're getting things done, you're hurting the people that are around you. Wow. And many of us, God has called us to do great things, but there are people around us that we're supposed to take with us. Yeah. There are people around us that we're supposed to encourage along the way, that we're supposed to love along the way. And so I had to begin to change my mindset and sacrifice some time. When I came in in the morning, you know, you're most productive in the morning. I got to get to work. Got to get my coffee. No, no, no. I started because it was a different culture than I was used to. It was a different age demographic than I was used to. I'm used to the city. I talk fast and loud. Like, I'm from the South, but I love big cities. This was a very, very small town, a lot slower pace of life. And so I had to change some of my thinking and come in and say, well, how are you doing today? <laughs> oh, Really? <laughs> really? Wow. But, but, but I learned, and it seems funny, but, but I learned that, hey, there, there's actually value in this. Yeah. Like, like they're getting something, but I'm also getting something. But because what can happen for most of us is, is we're so, I'm going, I got my goals, I got my things, and then when you get there, you're all alone. And so many of you, you're successful in life. You got your job, you got your degree, you got all that, but you don't got nobody. And I think it's more important for us to maybe slow down a little bit yep. and say, let's take some people along with us. Let's grow together. Let, let's bring some people in community because there's probably some people that are going through the same thing that I'm going through. Yeah. And so instead of me feeling like I'm all on my own, why don't we talk about it and, and grow through this together? Yeah. Yeah. And I know it's not just me that struggles with this because uh, if you're in the room today, congratulations, you are the most narcissistic generation to ever have lived. Congratulations, you won something. Don't you like winning stuff? 
But no matter what age you are, it, it, from the greatest generation to baby boomers to Gen X, millennials, Gen Z, and on down, we are progressively getting more and more narcissistic. And what it means is, is that what I am going through, whether good or bad, what my goals are, what my vision is, what my relationship is, what my business is, what my contacts are, whatever it may be, is more important than you. And unless you can help me, unless you are the way that I want you to look, the way that I want you to talk, the way that I want you to be, unless you are like that, then I don't have any time for you. The, the story, uh, the reason that uh, narcissism, it comes from the story of Narcissus, was a Greek mythological tale. And, and Narcissus was this prince that was very good looking, very handsome, but, but no one was ever good enough for him. He had people that wanted to be in relationship with him, people that wanted to marry him, people that wanted to date him, and they were never good enough for him. Because he said, I'm the best, I'm the greatest, you're not good enough for me. If you get a little bit better, then maybe I'll be in relationship with you. And so the story goes that one day he was walking along a stream and he looked in the stream and saw the reflection of himself and he fell in love with himself. And he fell so madly in love with himself, it was the most beautiful thing he'd ever saw, himself. He ends up staring for so long that he dies of starvation because he didn't want to take his eyes off of himself. Instead of being around some people that could have helped him, could have fed him, could have given him affirmation, could have worked through those things in his life, like, hey, that's kind of weird that you're falling in love with yourself. Let's talk about that. Let's work through that. <laughs> instead of doing all that, no, no, listen, instead of doing all that, he literally died because he couldn't take his eyes off of himself. And you're like, oh, that's great. That's great, whatever. Well, I was thinking about this today. I, I was thinking, well, do, you know, do we think about ourselves a lot? Are we narcissistic? And I just thought, maybe we don't look in a pool of water but maybe there's another mirror that takes our time. And, and, and maybe, maybe we don't think that we're that great looking, uh, but maybe you have a couple thousand selfies on your phone. And, and maybe you have just the right angle. And maybe you're the type of person when someone takes a group photo, you only like it if you look good. And everybody else can look bad, but all that matters is if you look good. Come on, let's be real. And so what can happen is, is we have this mirror that we're looking into, and I'm getting text messages, stop texting me, people. <laughs> You're messing up my illustration. It's all about me right now. See, I'm just, I'm just kidding. But what happens is we get so focused on this where there could be people that need us, people that need our affirmation, people that need our love, people that need something from us, and we need to give it to them because they're a part of our community, but we can't take our eyes off of ourselves. And, and I've got nothing against selfies. I've got a lot on my phone. Uh, I've got nothing against social media. But when it comes to the point, when it's such a real way to measure how much are you looking at yourself versus how much you're looking at other people. How much are you caring only about what benefits you and how much are you caring about how you can help other people? Giving versus getting. Are, are you only talking to that person because of their contacts? Or are you only talking to that person because of the business investment? Are you only talking to that person because you can hope you can talk to their girlfriend or, or you know, their friend's friend? You know what I'm saying? Like, why are we, why are we in these relationships? We, we got to take our eyes off of ourselves and realize that we have to give more than we can get. Come on, somebody say, somebody say we got to give. Come on. We got to give of ourselves. And, and the last one, so they, so they were gathering, they were giving and the last one is, they were growing. They were growing. Verse 47 says this, and each day the Lord added to their fellowship. I, I just want to let you know that, that I believe, and we're going to be that church where we believe that this church should be growing. Like, like I've got nothing against small churches. I, I've got nothing against churches that, that are going through hard times. But, but if you're going to be a true New Testament community, you've got to be growing. Like it, it doesn't have to be hundreds of people. It doesn't have to be dozens of people, but there should be growth in your community. Like there should be growth in the number of believers. But, but I don't want you to think about growth in numbers because I know it'd be so easy to misinterpret right now that, okay, well, he's just talking about growing the church and he's just trying to get more people in the seats. And that's just like other, every other pastor. Could it be that it's not so much about growing this building, these seats? Could it be that it's about growing the church, which is you? Could, could it be about your life growing? Could, could it be that your life needs to grow? 
Could it be that there are callings and there are purposes and there are things that God has anointed you to do and it needs to be growing, but it's not right now? Because I think a lot of us would say, if we were honest, God, I don't really feel like I'm growing at the pace that I want to. I don't really feel like I'm growing and I don't really feel like I'm at the level that you called me to be. Like, I feel like I'm supposed to be better right now. I feel like I'm supposed to be more well-known by now. Like, Like, I thought you were calling me to do all these things. Could it be that you're not growing because you're not in community. Because I believe if you're really gonna live out your calling in this life, whatever it may be to be a business person, to be a missionary, to be a stay-at-home parent, whatever it may be, that you're not gonna be able to live out your calling outside of the context of community. I'll say it one more time a little bit more slower. You're not gonna be able to live out your calling outside of the context of community. Because you're gonna hit a point, no matter how good you are, no matter how smart you are, no matter how many good looking you are, you're going to hit a point where you need somebody. And you can either be the lone wolf at the top or you can take some people with you. And you can realize that I've got to be in community to grow. A lot of times in the church, we use this language being planted, being planted in a church, being planted in a community of believers. What's interesting to me is we are so transient as people. I listen to a lot of podcasts about sociology and all these different things, and and, and we're so transient as a people. Like, we live in Round Rock, which is very transient. Like, nobody that lives in Round Rock is from Round Rock. Like, have you ever noticed that before? Like, maybe a few of you in here. Everybody's like, oh, I'm from Houston. I'm from Dallas. I'm from California. I'm from New York. So we're transient, and what happens is, is we're trying to find the place that we belong. And so we go from place to place to place. And if I could just move to that city, and if I could just be a part of that movement, and if I could just know those people, then I would finally feel connected. Then I would finally feel like I've made it. I would finally feel like I belong. But what happens is just like a plant, if you keep planting it over and over and over, it never has time to get nutrients from the soil that it's in. And so the plant ends up dying. And it's, it's messy being a part of community. But like, it's messy being a part of a church. Because sometimes you got to get in the mud with some people. Like, sometimes you got to get in dirt with some people. you got to know the dirty details. But there are some nutrients in that. There's some things in the soil that if you keep pulling yourself up, and if you're not devoted to the community, like I mentioned at the beginning, if you're not devoted, you're not going to get the nutrients you need to grow. And I believe that God has a calling on your life and he has a purpose on your life and every one of you are destined to do great things that he destined it even before you were born, even before anybody thought about you being born, that God has great things for your life. But could it be the thing that is stopping you is you are not devoted to community. You are not devoted to where there are some people in your life that can tell you you are a jerk. There are some people in your life that can tell you, oh, you're sinning. Like there's some people in your life that are telling you, hey, I see that you're going down this wrong direction and you haven't messed up yet, but I see it coming. Because all of us have blind spots and if we don't have other people around us, we're not going to be able to see those areas of our life. So you got to have some people that can see some things that you can't see if you're really going to grow into all that God has for you. But I think so many of us, we grow to the level that we can do it on our own. Like, like I'm talented. I can do this. I'm educated. I come from a good family. Or maybe you didn't. Maybe I pulled myself up by my bootstraps. Nobody got me here. I made myself on my own. No, I don't owe anybody anything. And we'll do what we can, but then we reach a point where we can't do it on our own anymore. And we get stuck just like those fish that you can put them in a small container and they'll stay small or you can put them in a larger container and they grow to match the container that they're in and I think some of us depending on the community that we are around maybe it's the size and the level of the anointing that we can grow into maybe your willingness to be open and say hey here are the broken parts of me I know it's scary I don't really want to share this with anybody but here's what's messed up about me can you help me maybe that is the cursor and the the prerequisite of how much we can grow in God 
maybe, just maybe, it, it isn't listening to another podcast or practicing another song or, or, or getting another loan or trying to start another business. Maybe the reason that it's not working is because you have not planted yourself in community. And I, I just want to let you know as I'm closing today, we can all stand together, that I believe that this is a healthy place for you to be planted. Because we, we say this a lot, and it's kind of a churchy thing to say, but, but healthy things grow. Like, like, you shouldn't be worrying about your growth, you should be worrying about your health. So many of us, we worry about our growth, and we become unhealthy trying to grow, and we become, we become sick and anemic and septic and toxic. Like, like I mentioned in the first service, I was joking, I said, we could grow this church by me giving a car away every Sunday. Like, we would have people here, but it wouldn't be healthy. Like, like you can grow yourself by eating pizza every day. Trust me, I've done it. But you're not going to be healthy. And at some point, you're going to start to have things that affect your body and affect your mind and affect your lifestyle. Just like as believers, if we are not focusing on our health, at some point, all the things that we're trying to reach and all the things that we're trying to accomplish and trying to hear God's voice and trying to get revelation from his word, all these things that we're trying to do, it's like, why can't I get that done anymore? Why can't I do that anymore? It's just like if you're eating unhealthy, it's like, why can't I work out like I used to? Why, why am I out of breath like I, I used to be able to do this? No problem. Maybe it's because you're not healthy. So I think if we would choose to be healthy in community, if we would choose as a church to focus more on our health than our growth, we'll grow. Like, I don't know a lot about biology. I took it Miss Heron sophomore year, Northwood High School. I don't know a lot, but I know one of the things that qualifies you as alive is that you're growing. So if you are healthy, you should be growing. Like our family should be growing and salvations and all that sort of thing but I'm, I'm talking about you I think that God has so much more for you we talked about it last week is 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 your this God's that like the things that you have settled for the things that you think are great is it really that great or does God have more for you it's just is this just the beginning of all that God has for you like, like, could it be that this is just the beginning of what God has for Oasis Church? Like, like I don't think we even scratch the surface of what God is going to do through this community, but we got to be healthy for him to keep doing it. So I believe that we got to grow in this context of community. And like I said, we're doing some practical things. Make a commitment to be here on Sundays. I know there's travel. I know it's summertime. I know there's vacations. I've got a family vacation plan too, but when you're not on vacation... Let's just make a commitment, not because of the songs, not because of the preaching, but because this is my community. Like, these are my people. Like, I know if I'm having a bad week, I can come here and maybe not everybody, but I can talk to somebody. Because another thing, I think as a church, maybe you won't know everybody, but we've got to create an environment where everybody knows somebody. Like, we got to create an environment where everyone has someone that they can do this life with. You want to be a part of that church? Come on. Can we just give one more hand clap to God this morning?